I'm sure you must have enjoyed your meal and you're back with a lot of energy for the next uh, session. Uh, the plenary two is focused on best value principles for procurement and investments, high standards, transparency, and sustainable debt. Uh, with that, I would like to invite the chair for the session, Dr. Arvind Mayaram. Mr. Tanaka. Mr. Abra Jano. Mr. Kendall and Mr. Vikram Surya. Thank you, and I'll hand over the proceedings to Dr. Mayram. Thank you, there. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to remind you that if you intend to fall asleep after lunch, please raise your hand. We're going to discuss from now till 3 o'clock a subject which underlies all developmental processes, which is procurement of goods, services, and with public-private partnerships, we have seen procurement of even partners to, for development of projects. In South Asia, but also in the perspective of uh, the wider region, which is the Indo-Pacific region, we are seeing increasingly the discussion of integration to increase trade, to uh, improve channels of investment, uh, which will lead to greater integration, uh, leading to prosperity for people in the region. South Asia, in any case, is the house of very large number of poor, so is Southeast Asia. And therefore, there is need, there is an urgent need, actually, to speed up the integration process, which will uh, also allow the people in living in these, uh, the countries in the region, to benefit from the uh, development processes. Today, we are talking about best value principle for procurement and investment. Uh, and when we talk of best value, we are talking of very high standards of transparency. We are also speaking about the uh, transparency needs and uh, also the uh, one other important aspect, which is uh, debt, because in countries uh, like uh, those which are in South uh, Asia, there is always this great struggle between the developmental needs and the availability of resources. And uh, we are seeing increasingly with rising public debt that fiscal sustainability of very high debt is now uh, reaching its limits. There is much lesser headroom for borrowing than it used to be earlier. And therefore, there is need also to look at this whole issue that we might have very good standards of procurement, but we also need to look at how uh, sustainable uh, resources can be, uh, can be accessed by countries to f carry forward this entire process. So we have a very illustrious uh, uh, panel today. Uh, we have Mr. Tomohiro Tanaka, who's Assistant Director Development Assistance Policy Coordination Division, Bureau of International Cooperation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Uh, Mr. Todd Abrajano, Senior Advisor to the Director, U.S. Trade and Development Agencies. Mr. Timothy Candle, uh, Economic Counselor, High Commission of Australia to India. Uh, Mr. Vikram Surya, Chairman, National Procurement Commission, Government of Sri Lanka. 
with very wide experience uh, they will bring to bear on the discussions that take place today. The format, like in the last uh, session that you've seen, uh, the speakers will uh, put forward their proposition for five to seven minutes. And then we will have a discussion amongst the panelists, followed by uh, open session with the delegates. Uh, so I would request uh, Mr. Tanaka to come first and uh, speak to us about his thoughts. Thank you very much, Mr. Avind, and thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here as a panelist. Um, when it comes to enhancing connectivity, I believe that nobody will disagree with the importance of infrastructure. What do you think the most basic function of infrastructure is? I believe that the infrastructure should be to connect people and goods, which are underpinning the economic growth and sustainable development. When I was in Kenya as a diplomat from 2016 to 2018, last spring, I have seen the enormous demands of infrastructure. In fact, I have seen various infrastructure projects in Africa. But I encountered a serious shocking incident, which was, as some of you remember through news, a 12 million US dollar bridge collapsed before it was completed. And many people were injured. And after this news, I reaffirm that simply paving roads <coughs> or building bridge or constructing ports will we not suffice to be infrastructure. Infrastructure should be follows the international standard on quality infrastructure. In this regard, Japan has promoted quality infrastructure for example, in 2016, Japan, a G7 under Japanese presidency, adapted G7 Isashima principles for promoting quality infrastructure investment, which outline the elements of quality infrastructure. And now uh, we have cooperated to elaborate these elements with like-minded countries, such as the United States and India, and other international organizations, such as OECD and G20. Let me touch upon some of examples of Japanese contribution to enhancing regional connectivity. High-speed railway projects which will connect the largest city, Mumbai, with Ahmedabad, a prospering commercial and economical city. We will be a good example. As Ambassador Hiramatsu stated out in the opening session early today, the project will drastically reduce the traveling time from seven hours to two hours from Mumbai to Ahmedabad. Another example of Japanese contribution to this region is cross-border network improvement project in Bangladesh. This project uh, will increase intercity transportation and logistics network by developing uh, inter international roads investment in Bangladesh, thereby contributing to increasing connectivity with neighboring countries, such as India, Bhutan, Nepal, and Myanmar. Despite of our efforts, the infrastructure 
finance is insufficient compared to the enormous demands of infrastructure in the world. For example, according to ADB, in Asia, the demand of infrastructure is projected to about 1.7 trillion US dollars, while only half of this demand is being met at present. And current uh, ODA is no longer a major portion for uh, flow to developing countries from developed country. That's why we need to utilize effective resource mobilizations. For example, PSI, private sector instrument, PPP, public-private uh, partner, public partnership, and also, at the same time, debt sustainability is another important element to be quality infrastructure. Only borrower countries need to be followed, but also lender countries should be committed to debt sustainability. For example, Japan uh, sets low interest rates and long repayment period for our concessional loans. We're taking focus on borrowers countries' debt sustainability with uting, utilizing tools such as debt sustainability analysis. So I believe both lender countries and borrower countries should be um, committed to uh, sustainable financing. In conclusion, uh, Japan is now uh, focusing on G20 Osaka summit and TICAT 7 next year. Taking these opportunities, we are elaborating an international standard on quality infrastructure, including debt sustainability and effective resource mobilizations, addition to Isashima principles. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Japan has uh, taken a lead in providing uh, not only financial resources but also technology transfer. However, the question of debt sustainability we'll have to explore a little more because uh, while the lender can certainly do uh, an analysis of debt sustainability, but the question of availability of resources will still remain and we'll need to explore a bit more. Todd, would you like to take a go? Sure, good afternoon everyone. Thank you, Arvind, for uh, hosting the panel today. I'm gonna offer some prepared remarks and then I look forward to the interactive discussion later on in the panel. You know, we're meeting at a very important time when countries are struggling to keep pace with global infrastructure demand, driven mainly by emerging markets like India. As countries invest in their infrastructure, we are witnessing an increasing awareness of quality and value for money in infrastructure spending. I'm pleased that Cuts International, FICI, the East-West Center, and the U.S. State Department have added the discussion of best value principles to the conference agenda today. As a representative of the U.S. government and representing an agency that specifically works with U.S. companies on a daily basis, I know there are tremendous consequences for U.S. industry that produces some of the world's best goods, services, and technologies, as well as for our partners in emerging markets that cannot afford to waste money on poor quality infrastructure solutions. My agency, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, has decades of experience operating in these emerging markets and has been leading the push for countries to focus on quality infrastructure investments and not simply the cheapest costs. We know that quality infrastructure drives economic growth and productivity. And at USTDA, we have a history 
of results that demonstrate the value countries achieve when they invest in sustainable infrastructure. USTDA supports early stage project preparation work through the financing of feasibility studies, technical assistance, and pilot projects, which means we lay the groundwork for countries to make informed investment decisions based on quality solutions. Our unique, our unique mission is a win-win. While we help our partner countries advance their infrastructure goals, we also connect U.S. businesses to new export opportunities at the same time. We work in many emerging markets around the world. However, the South and Southeast Asia region represents one of our largest portfolios. Across the region, we are developing partnerships to improve aviation safety and efficiency, deploying innovative solutions for smart cities, and diversifying energy infrastructure, including renewable energy, natural gas, and cleaner coal. Through these projects, the agency has generated $14.5 billion in U.S. exports, supporting over 1,000 American companies here in this region. I'm happy to be here today to share some of our lessons learned when developing infrastructure projects and how to support the sustainability of those investments, as well as share some of our best practices for supporting procurement systems that prioritize high value and quality. I'd like to first turn to our experience improving connectivity in South Asia and where we have seen success. The U.S. government has made connectivity a centerpiece of its Indo-Pacific strategy, as evidenced through three new initiatives launched this past July, aimed at strengthening digital connectivity, improving infrastructure assistance, and supporting energy development. At the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, we are working to implement these initiatives and strengthen regional connectivity through our suite of project development tools that I mentioned earlier. Infrastructure development is fundamental to furthering regional connectivity. India is our largest market in this region. We have supported over 160 projects with strong partners from the government of India, as well as the private sector. We have also significant portfolios in Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. In assessing potential projects, we consider the local economic impact, and in some cases, regional impact. One example, as Ambassador Juster pointed out earlier, is in the aviation sector, where we have worked on a myriad of projects to support the forecasted growth in India and the surrounding region. Next, I'd like to focus on what USTDA does to promote sustainable, high-value public procurement and investment. In order to succeed in promoting and implementing sustainable, high-value procurements within any country, you must invest in your human capital. Countries must prioritize training procurement officials to a much higher level in order to transition to value-based procurement mechanisms. They need to understand and know how to apply and enforce international standards, as well as calculate the total cost of ownership using life cycle cost analysis to procure and implement higher value projects. You have to support the professionalization of your procurement workforce. One of the greatest lessons that we have learned is that even the best project plans can quickly change during the, pro the project implementation stage, and more specifically, during the procurement stage. Procuring quality goods and services can make the difference between successful project implementation and project failure. About 10 years ago, we started hearing from many of our partner countries about the difficulties they encountered during the procurement process, including a lack of international bidders and feeling pressured to always choose the lowest priced bid, even when the quality of those bids was questioned, and how this greatly affected the outcomes of their procurements. We also heard from our U.S. industry partners that they were not bidding on these opportunities because the procurements were going to be awarded to the lowest cost basis without concern for quality or overall service, and they just aren't competitive in those types of, st of tenders. In response, we launched the Global Procurement Initiative, GPI, Understanding Best Value, with the goal of helping our overseas partners obtain greater value and quality through their procurement processes, while at the same time leveling the playing field and fostering greater international cooperation and competition. The GPI provides training and technical assistance to public procurement officials through which we share best practices and ensure that our public sector partners are getting the best value for their money. The training enables them to establish policies that lead to overall government savings, more transparency, 
and greater value for public funds. The GPI has proven results. Since we launched the initiative, we have partnered with 11 countries and trained over 1,000 procurement officials. We will not stop there. We continue to hear from new countries that would like to partner under the GPI. In pursuing these ambitious goals, it has been important to develop a number of dynamic partnerships to drive success. We work with George Washington University's Government Procurement Law Program, whose world-class experts lead and help design GPI programs. We have also partners with, with Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, also known as METI, the World Bank, and we work regularly with the Asian Development Bank to leverage all possible resources and advance goals of our GPI partners. So far in the Indo-Pacific region, we have developed GPI partnerships with the Philippines, Vietnam, and the state of Maharashtra here in India. Lastly, I want to discuss what countries must consider when developing in infrastructure projects in order to maintain sustainable debt levels. For USTDA, supporting the development of quality, sustainable infrastructure in emerging markets is a fundamental part of our mission. Through our many years of expertise, we have found that when countries procure based on low cost, they end up with major setbacks and sometimes even failures within just a few years. When governments spend large sums of taxpayer funds on infrastructure, they expect it to last for decades. They need it to last for decades so that they can pay off the debt they took on to build it. But procuring based on low cost tends to shortchange the goals of quality and sustainability. And there is nothing cheap about buying something twice. USTDA's experience and expertise have allowed us to identify four focus areas that can enable overseas governments to achieve value-based qualitative outcomes when implementing infrastructure projects. The first of those is project planning. The second is utilizing market resources and due diligence. The third is building that professionalized procurement system. And fourth is overall management of your contracts and your projects. And I'm happy to get into those in more detail as we go on, but in time consideration, I'll turn it back to you, Arvind, and can move on to, uh, to Tim. Thank you, Todd. I think that's, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, and as we discuss, we will per perhaps uh, have a little more details on some of these uh, initiatives that you've taken. Uh, I request now uh, Timothy to come in. And Thank you, Arvind. Um, what I wanted to do was probably talk about three things this afternoon. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Australian policy context uh, to identify some of the work that the Australian government's doing in terms of um, contributing to regional infrastructure and then to outline some of the standards and principles that the Australian government promote as, as integral to um, sustainable uh, and transparent uh, infrastructure investment. I think, um, though, at the outset, it, uh, we can comfortably say uh, from some of the reflections of speakers today that um, the, the funding and supply of infrastructure is going to be one of the Indo-Pacific's greatest development challenges. And one of the, um, the figures or the metrics that, that the Australian government uses to understand the extent of this challenge is some of the ADB data that suggests that um, between now and, and 2030, the, the need for um, infrastructure finance uh, for the region extends to about $26 trillion. And of that, you've got a, a significant component of that focuses on the power sector, but transport, telecommunications, water and sanitation are key components. In talking about the Australian policy context, I wanted to uh, draw on two um, uh, framework documents that we have. One is our foreign policy uh, white paper that was released uh, a year ago, and it frames uh, Australia's foreign policy agenda around our commitments in the Indo-Pacific. From an Australian point of view, Australia is absolutely integral to what's happening in the Indo-Pacific because our island continent looks out over both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. 
And um, I guess where, where my perspective differs a little bit from some of the other speakers today is that while we're committed to the subcontinent and the South Asia region, we have a considerable presence in the Pacific Ocean and our relationship with Pacific Island states is fundamental to what we do, particularly in our um, development program and infrastructure financing. The other uh, framing document is the India Economic Strategy, which was uh, a report that was produced by our um, former Foreign Secretary and former High Commissioner here to India that looks at the bilateral relationship between Australia and India and the way that we're going to partner out to 2035. So this document really looks at areas of complementarity between our two economies. It looks at the way that um, we can take a sector and state-based approach to um, facilitate our engagement. But beyond that, I think it really commits to um, to greater connectivity uh, and, and regional investment in, in uh, the, the subcontinent and broader region. I think what, the, what these two documents suggest to us is that uh, a major change has occurred in the way the region is being understood as power shifts to the Indo-Pacific. And from our point of view, it's trade, investment, regional org organisations and infrastructure that are starting to be used as instruments of influence to build strategic influence across the Indo-Pacific. Australia welcomes more investment uh, in the infrastructure sector and it's committed to working with um, partners, including government partners, multilateral de development banks, international institutions and the private sector. In terms of what Australia is doing to address the uh, infrastructure gap, uh, we spend about $490 million per annum, Australian dollars, uh, to, to help support infrastructure in the region. And we probably do this in, in largely three ways. One is through our, our work with uh, multilateral development banks and um, primarily the, the World Bank, the ADB and the AIIB. Uh, we're a founding member of the ADB and um, also a founding member of the AIIB. The, the second way that we look to make a contribution is through our core contributions to some of these international organisations and particularly to their financing arms of um, the ADB, the Asian Development Fund and to the AIIB. But probably the most, um, one of the most important areas where we look to make a contribution is through working bilaterally with a, a number of our development partners. And this is, is very common in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And um, in the region here, we, we achieve this through the, the South Asia Trade Facilitation Program and the Infra Infrastructure for Growth Program. In the Pacific, more generally, uh, recently, we've made major commitments to um, uh, telecommunications infrastructure between Sydney, Port Moresby and Honiara. Just turning to the standards that the um, Australian government identifies for procuring an investment, I'd probably frame them in, in four different ways. So the first one is that investments should always be uh, transparent, non-discriminatory and promote fair and open competition. By that I mean that initiatives should not have um, um, any perverse effects on, on free trade uh, or, or regional or global trade. The, it's also absolutely integral that risk across the project cycle is clearly identified in the planning stage and the partners are, um, are worked, uh, given the capacity and the support to, um, to identify how they might be uh, mediated. The, the second uh, key criteria is that projects should always uphold robust standards. They should be driven by effective governance throughout the whole project cycle. Thirdly, investment should, be, um, should really meet a genuine need and that genuine need should be driven by the end user's economic and social uh, development objectives. Finally, um, as, as has been mentioned at a few junctures today, 
uh, the, these financing initiatives should avoid unsustainable debt burdens and lending proposals should contribute to the economic resilience of those, um, those receiving entities. So just in, in summary, I think, uh, you know, a few um, key takeaways from this. I think um, I'd like to, to uh, remind the audience that the, the, the importance of the Pacific component of the um, Indo-Pacific construct that Pradeep was um, mentioning this morning, uh, I think there, there's an emerging discussion here about how we harmonise systems of procurement standards and principles uh, for all, um, both borrowers and lenders. Uh, and that lends to, to itself to a discussion about the importance of establishing international norms. And a final comment, um, and I make this partly because there hasn't been much reference to it, um, not, certainly not explicitly today, but that's the importance of RCEP as a regional trade agreement and the way in which that will build trade connectivity across the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I'd like to remind the audience that there is uh, an app, uh, slido.com. Please make use of it if you have questions uh, or even if you have brief observation, please use the, the app and uh, it'll be easier for us to coordinate the questions from here. Uh, I'd request uh, now, the, uh, last but not the least, uh, Mr. Vikram Surya, who's chairman of National Procurement Commission in Sri Lanka, to make his observation. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we heard, uh, I will first, uh, my deliberations will more or less uh, focused on the best practices and principles that will require for uh, better investments to bring into the countries and, and to improve the confidence of the stakeholders and the players who are participating in the economic development and the social development. So in that perspective, I would say that uh, it's a challenge for each country in this region to invite the investors and then uh, bring in them for the development of infrastructure and other related uh, activities which need the social development of the citizens. In that perspective, I think everybody recognized that the procurement play a vital role. And uh, so in, in that context, I would tell that uh, it's very important for the players to bring in their investments or to make development partners with the uh, individual countries. It's very important that uh, confidence being improved within the country for the people to fearlessly come in, invest, and shake hand with the people. So, a good systems, transparent systems within the, within the countries, and especially within the procurement, is very important. And it's widely spoken about, procurement is one of the areas which leads to a lot of corruptions when it comes to the various procurements. So it's very important that you improve the, the openness and transparency by way of divulging information to the, all the people whom can be, I think, contested certain uh, procurement decisions even. So in that respect, I would say that uh, it is very important that uh, inside uh, each country, the procurement systems are being well regulated and managed. Now, for instance, I would tell you the example in Sri Lanka. We were practicing for uh, several decades that uh, uh, 
an administrative system for procuring public goods. But then I think uh, we learned a lesson by not flowing in fruitful investments into the country. So to improve the confidence and also to improve the con competition of the government has re recently revised the regulatory system by creating the National Procurement Committee being our site uh, agency to look after the uh, public procurement. So the, the country, now the procurement rules are being prepared to enshrine the basic principles of good, good governance, fairness, equality, transparency, and competitiveness, and the value for money, the cost, uh, the, the cost competitiveness. So by that way, I think you can show to the others that you are. So in each of the procurement cycle, in each place, it's very important that we improve the transparency and fairness system. One of the things that uh, generally comes into procurement is, uh, except for I think certain things, open competition bidding can be promoted. But it's <coughs> sometimes due to certain national requirements, you go for national competitive bidding something like that, different bidding types. But we have decided to, I think, limit the number of, I think, uh, restrictions placed on the, the open competitive bidding, thereby to allow the participants to come into the picture. Then the other thing is the, in the process, the, the transparency. That's the, the procurement, uh, in the procurement uh, process, the, the right of the players to appeal for the, for the procurement decisions. So that has to be improved. Then only the confidence has to be. So the why that I have not been selected or something like that at an institutional level. And then, of course, the appealing bodies, right from the from their appointment to the functioning of the thing, it's very important that I think they should be very independent and operating in good uh, principles and openness. So the dissemination of procurement data is also very important because uh, the procurement data can be used by various people, departments, the research organizations to uh, do research type of work on the procurements, so thereby to improve the, the systems further. So it's very important nowadays that with the technological improvements to embrace the new technologies into the system and to conduct these things. One way to, I think, uh, in procurement in most of this region, one of the, I think, uh, problems is the, the, the involvement of the human and the limitation of the human capacities into the large-scale procurement. So it's very important that in that respect, the, we move towards a technological development, embracement of like uh, electronic government procurement or electronic procurement systems to the systems, thereby employing more and more technological innovations into the procurement area, and also to build the capacities within the procurement staff who are engaged in the thing. And a lot of, I think, uh, procurement staffs are not incapacitative in handling their activities. So it's very important that uh, these things are built within the, so sound programs has to be brought in, I think within regions, that uh, in the countries to bring up the thing. In that respect, I would 
I would like to uh, briefly touch upon the, the SA network program operating within the SAC countries. Public procurement network uh, for South Asian region, SAPPN, and uh, which is the procurement institutions are networking within uh, the, the inter interregional uh, thing, so, uh, inter inter country uh, partnership, and uh, we share the knowledge of the the procurement. Uh, knowledge of each country, and thereby learning best practices and other things. So it's very important, in my concluding remarks, I would tell that it's very important to develop the procurement best practices and uh, systems within the, within, uh, within the country for, for the investors to come, and then uh, invest it in a country, and then even the uh, other regional countries to participate in your development activities. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me uh, be a bit provocative and uh, let's see if we can uh, make this a little more interesting. Uh, Todd, you were saying that you're running this uh, training program, but I want to ask this question which has, in uh, various fora which has come up, uh, and sometimes it is a matter of concern also to developing countries. That standard setting in itself can become exclus ex exclusionary. For instance, uh, we have found that in many countries, standards have become non-tariff barriers. So. The, the standards are set in a particular, in a manner that they favor, for instance, if they are G7 standards and they would favor companies from G7 to be able to compete better or may, or may exclude a large number of others because the standards have been set in a particular manner. Uh, do you think that is a genuine concern at some level? Well, I think with respect to standards, uh, you've got to look at it from sort of the buyer's perspective, right? When you're buying into large-scale large infrastructure projects, you want quality. We've all heard these stories about how some of these projects have been built and two, three years later, they're complete, they're complete failures. And so when you're spending billions of dollars on a large-scale project, that's not, that's not the outcome you're looking for. So in terms of standards, there have to be some. And so with what we do at USTDA and our, glo our global procurement initiative, the standards that we set are, are set with respect to quality infrastructure and best value. And so we're not trying to exclude anyone, we're trying to include as many as possible. And so, as I mentioned before, the problem that we saw from the US perspective is that too many uh, public tenders were looking just at low cost. And so the US companies weren't getting an opportunity to bid because every time they did, they were never winning. And so uh, we wanted, through our program, to open it up to as many potential uh, bidders as possible and not really exclude anyone. Let me ask you this, that in the United States when you do bidding, if your standards are for a nature which only would uh, permit U.S. companies, for instance, you could, while you're setting standards, the standards are not only in terms of quality parameters, but you'll also have financials. You could set a financial standard so high that companies from developing countries cannot compete. So quality in itself is, is a, a normative word which needs to be determined on the basis of a context. So I, uh, would, you, would you think that, that that could be a genuine concern that when the standards are being set by the G8 or G7 or developed countries, uh, you end up having this kind of an issue where uh, you tend to move it in a direction which would help con companies from those countries. I, I certainly can see that argument. Uh, I, I, think, I think the bigger question is, you know, ultimately, and back to what I said before, what do buyers ultimately want? They want the highest quality project that they can get for the best value. And so, well, and I can only speak for what my agency does. I can't speak for what other countries and 
and other agencies do. But uh, at USTEA, when we work with uh, countries or we work with US vendors, we, we try to set the quality standards so that, as I said, as many, as many countries as, or as many companies can, can bid as possible. Uh, we don't set standards at USTDA just for US companies. We just want to make sure that US companies can be included. And so what we found through the tendering process in the countries and the, uh, and the projects that we work on, uh, there are bids from all over the world every single time. Uh, but the US companies are also at least allowed to bid and feel like they can compete. And so with respect to what we do, that's, that's what we have found. Uh, but I can certainly see uh, from the perspective that you brought up. That but uh, Mr. Vikram there. Surya, as the chairman of uh, a procurement commission, does this question sometime come before you when you're looking at international competitive bidding processes, that the standards have been set in a manner which would be uh, disadvantageous to, say, Sri Lankan companies? I think if... Uh, Uh, yes and no. <laughs> if you, I think, uh, if you look at the, the, the procurement per se, that uh, the countries have a issue that uh, what kind of standards that we are following. It's true that I think everybody is hammering, clamoring for the quality. But then, to what kind of quality that we should go is an issue to be addressed by each country based on various other factors, not basically looking at the procurement uh, per se. If you ask the various sectors, uh, specialist sectors, they will say we like to get the best kind of things flowing into our, our organization. But can, can, this, can the governments afford to afford to invest like that, invest on like that. So it's a, it's a balance between the, uh, the organizations and the people to make that what kind of uh, thing in the procurement. But what's important is the value for money. So in the procurement, the very important concepts that has to be practiced is the value for money. And then ultimately see that whether it is fitting for the, fitting for the task. So in that perspective, I think we have to decide because you have several standards and there's no harmonized standards in, in all of this. You have the international standards, you have the British standards, you have the Japanese standards, the countries have their own standards and the indi individual countries are trying to develop their own standards. Why? Why everybody can't fall in line with one standard? That's because the, each country has a unique value of identify certain things. So they try to standardize things. And by harmonizing with the most of the in, in, uh, international aspects, they want to bring in certain things that, that can be afforded within the standards. So, the, so it's very important that I think that uh, while recognizing that the quality is very important, but uh, how much that uh, can, the, can the countries afford the, the highest qualitative things is an issue to be, I think, addressed by each individual country. Now that brings us to a very in uh, interesting question and uh, uh, Timothy, maybe you could step in and say that if each country is going to have like British standards or Australian standards and so on, uh, then uh, the issue of harmonization takes on that much more uh, greater importance because if we need to do cross-border, uh, for instance, infrastructure and we want uh, more of connectivity, which will, uh, which will you know, kind of increase the trade between countries and so on, then uh, harmonization of, uh, in standards, not only in terms of trade facilitation, but also in, tr in terms of physical infrastructure, uh, procurement for pr physical infrastructure development would also be important. 
Yeah, thanks, Arvin. Um, so t to to go back on to the question of standard setting and whether it be can become exclusionary, firstly. Um, so I guess two parts of this, you know, the, the importance of standards, I think, are um, in, in one aspect of it is about protecting both um, borrowers and lenders uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the topics that have been discussed here in terms of quality and value for money. And I think also Todd's comment here about that's about inclusion rather than exclusion. So I think that's a, they're kind of important framing principles. Beyond that, there's a secondary question here about um, about bidding for contracts, inf large infrastructure projects. And this takes us back to the earlier discussion about human capital and the, the importance of, of building capability in, in areas of um, procurement and procurement management. On, on the issue of harmonisation itself, I think, um, it's it's absolutely critical, and I think there's um, there's a role for some of the international organisations, the World Bank, the G20, and others to, to really take some significant leadership here to to identify principles that are acceptable uh, to both developed and developing countries. Uh, do, in this context, has Japan ever come across similar issues when you have been? Uh, providing assistance to other countries, including India, for instance, in the, the bullet train that is coming up now, uh, the issue of the kind of standards that should be followed in procurement. Uh, do you find that there is enough harmony or that there is need for uh, changing the, those systems? So when, when Japan uh, offers our development assistance, it's uh, based on demand oriented from uh, recipient countries. So it should be uh, harmonized with developing countries' development policy itself. And we are closely cooperating with uh, developing countries to uh, enhance their economic growth and quality growth. Yeah. Okay, now uh, let me, uh, before we open, I'll just uh, uh, raise two other other questions which are, I think, important in the context of what we're discussing. Uh, one, of course, is this whole issue of life cycle procurement for, for, you know, analysis, life cycle analysis in terms of getting the best price in, which in any case in uh, public-private pri uh, partnership projects, this is now generally being followed all over the world. But one question which has arisen, and especially in the case of India we have seen, is this whole issue of having procuring a partner for a, a long period of time in terms of the development of, say, a road project and the life cycle is 25 years. Once you have contracted uh, out the project, uh, the economic cycles are now so short, as we have seen from 2008 or even before 2000 onwards, that it becomes extremely unpredictable to be having uh, to have a very long-term relationship on a contract which is signed at one point of time, uh, which may require renegotiations. But under the best principles of procurement, once the contract is do a done deal, it should not be open because then it perverts the entire process of procurement. So, how do you deal with issues of this nature uh, in the uh, current economic context? Sure, I'll take a I'll, I'll take a swing at that. Uh, you know, I think going back to sort of the last thing that I talked about in terms of uh, sustainable debt, uh, and and we recognize there are four things. I I think the the very first thing that countries should look at when they're when they're doing large scale projects uh, is the initial project planning. Uh, they've got to figure out, you know, and they've got to spend time and. They've got to invest some money in trying to make sure that the project that they're actually putting together is the best possible project for them. Uh, and that encompasses everything, including any long-term agreements that they would sign. Uh, but I also talked about uh, market research and, and due diligence. And I think in this particular question that this is key. Uh, you've got to take a look at not only the companies that you're signing deals with, you've got to take a look at the current economic conditions. And it, obviously it's hard 
to project over 15 or 20 years what, what the economies are going to do. Uh, but you've got to put yourself in the best possible position as well. And I think, as you mentioned, it, I think up front being able to negotiate uh, the terms of those agreements is, is the most important thing you can do. Uh, nobody wants to enter into a contract that's going to tie them down to a, a, a bad deal over the course of 15 or 20 years. And so uh, I really think that the early on negotiations is the, is the best thing that they can do in, during that market research and due diligence phase. Okay, let me uh, just ask the last question and then we'll go to the audience. Now, oh, one of the other issues that uh, we have seen is the complexity of procuring infrastructure projects. Uh, these are large projects. Uh, when I was in Kennedy School uh, in How at Harvard, uh, when we were discussing this whole issue of development of a project for uh, making it into a deal for private partner partners to come in, uh, we were informed that in the United States now the time which it takes for the entire procurement process to complete is close to five to seven years for a very large infrastructure project. And the question is that if, if we are going to make procurement, which is best principle procurement, which is going to be so complex, and I've seen in the UNECE also this discussion on in terms of uh, how to make it completely foolproof in terms of uh, transparency, et cetera. If it takes four to five years to, to really bring the deal out into the market, do we have that kind of time, especially in developing countries where the pressure of public expectation is so high, the election cycles are five years, can you wait for projects to you know, cook for that much number of years to get the best procurement principles in, uh, in practice? Any, anyone would like to take a shot at that? I'll, I'll jump in initially. We, we've actually seen this uh, in my agency uh, because uh, as I said, we're very early stage. We're you know, early project development. So you know, the projects that we do, feasibility studies, those sorts of things, we are very early on. Those projects typically take anywhere from six to 12 months, just the feasibility study portion. And what we have found is that the longer a study can take, the quicker technology can change. And by the time you may be done with a feasibility study, there may be a new technology that comes out that you haven't even considered. And so uh, I think that's obviously a huge issue. Uh, it's something that we are considering. And, and internally in our agency, we're trying to figure out ways that we can speed that process up in order to alleviate that very problem. So you're, you're absolutely right. That's an issue that everyone needs to think about. All right, I see uh, questions coming up on the ticker. Uh, so let me take a few of those. Uh, so what are the initiatives taken to build the capacity of business sector to engage in transparent and standard procurement practices? Mr. Vikram Surya, would you like to take that? Uh, in, uh, has the government of Sri Lanka done something to uh, train the private sector? I mean, public official training is on, but. Yes, I'll say. It's very important that I think we build uh, the capacities not only on the public sector, it's the in the private sector also because we have found a lot of uh, players who are, who are taking part in the public procurements are, up, are not up to the certain qualities. So, and the knowledge that they gained uh, through the processes are very small. So it's it's important that the the the, the, na the national governments do, I think, uh, take cognizance of this fact and then try to extend the 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 development of capacities within the private sector also. And in that perspective, I think what's important is, I think, first, if you look at particularly in the Sri Lankan context, Sri Lanka doesn't have a public public service for a procurement. Procurement being playing a vital role in the public uh, finances. So there's no uh, general general people who are participating in always the department uh, procurement activities. So as a result, no, no persons who are permanently engaged in. So it's very important that service has to be regulated and their standards are being improved by way of now say we we are thinking of introducing accreditation system 
to the, the public officers who are identified as a good procurement officers being accredited to a particular standards and then they should compose of any any of the procurement committees or things to for a decision making process so that's one kind of the thing that, and the other thing is to include the the procurement uh, knowledge and procurement uh, the principles theories behind the procurements into the curriculums of the the universities and to the the technical colleges who are playing a lower level role so that i think when they are ready to take up the positions either in public sector or in the private sector to to sharpen their knowledge they are already gained knowledge in the as a contribution to the the process uh, <coughs> uh, we have another question here availability of credit is a bigger issue than sustainability what about the availability of debt on non recourse basis to private sector developers is there any thought on that timothy uh, how is uh, how do you look at it uh, especially you uh, you know under the g20 initiative australia has set up a ppp hub and which is looking at a lot of these kind of issues any any thought on uh, on this so it's obviously one of the big challenges the the um, financing gap and i think um, earlier the the question was raised as to to what type of instruments we could employ to um, try and um, uh, draw more capital into um, the the infrastructure basket particularly as um, as mr. Tanaka said at a time when uh, um, development agencies around the world are reducing their their spend so I know with within the context of um, the department I work for we are trialling a range of instruments through which we can partner with the, the private sector in ways that have already been mentioned through um, uh, PPPs, but also through uh, impact investing, impact in investment funds, but also looking to to uh, broaden the range of partners that we can uh, work with in in delivering some of these projects. And particularly with um, uh, the, uh, the the investors, the high net worth individuals, um, and also um, with um, uh, some of the philanthropic capital that is there. So I think it's a way of trying to get have have more diversified settings, so we can seek capital from from a range of different places, and have and and mobilise that in a way that. Um, enables it to, to grow. Okay. Uh, now we have this, uh, I don't know, this sticker keeps moving up and down, so what's happening? Who's, who's managing this? Uh, why is government fund preferable than to the PPP fund under SDG projects? I don't understood what the question is, but perhaps what we are speaking about is why is government funding uh, preferred when it comes to SDG, SDG related projects instead of uh, mobilizing private finance. If that is the question, then it's quite obvious that most of the SDG related projects are not commercially viable and there is a very high regulatory risk there uh, especially because these relate to uh, you know sectors like drinking water and so on where uh, which is very close to the people and political preferences can change very quickly so the risk perception is very high but PPPs are not only BOTs I think there's also a perceptional issue here because you can have a public finance uh, made available to the private sector to develop and manage uh, so that private sector efficiencies are brought in and also higher level of accountability so that is being done in many places and i 
I think it's uh, it's wherever it's tried, it's it's working fairly well. Uh, can someone in the panel throw more light on sustainable debt in the context of public procurement? Would anybody you would like to? So, in the context of public procurement, um, light on sustainable debt, uh, Japan, for example, Japan has invited uh, public officials from developing countries such as Kenya and Mongolia for training in debt analysis and budgeting to their debt uh, managing as a technical cooperation. Uh, let me put this in a different context, which is uh, if you're talking of sustainable debt, which is sustainable public debt, Obviously, there is no answer to it because there are limits to which uh, the governments can borrow and they are determined by the kind of uh, fiscal deficits they run on their budget. So uh, the, the whole uh, concept of having sustainable debt only simply means that you need to remain within your means. Uh, but the, if we are talking of sustainable debt on the projects uh, or where we are saying that we, how can we you know, bring uh, market uh, forces to work on resource transfer to projects. Uh, for instance, capital markets, how capital markets can be tapped for public uh, projects. Then, of course, there are several ways of doing it. In India, for instance, uh, several instruments have been developed in this, uh, in this direction. Uh, infrastructure business, tr investment trusts are one, INVITS as they're called which are a very tax efficient instrument to channelize capital market funds into infrastructure. Similarly, infrastructure debt funds are another instrument of the similar nature. So there are several similar, you can have, uh, you know, uh, guarantees which are provided uh, or partial guarantees which are provided or monoline mono wraps which can be provided to raise money from the capital markets for infrastructure projects, but I think for that, we'll need another big session to discuss because it's a whole big, huge subject. Uh, now, uh, there's a question there. Thank you, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, I really need to add on that issue of sustainable debt on a macroeconomic level. Uh, it's, it's sustainable debt is like a moving goalpost. Uh, for instance, uh, the United States, U.S. economy has a 90% public debt GDP ratio. Japan has even higher, perhaps 160 or 200%. Bangladesh, as a developing economy, has a public debt GDP ratio of only 35%. Now, in, in the case of Bangladesh, of course, transparency and um, value for money is important when you take on debt. but as a growing economy, uh, growing at 7% uh, annual um, rate of GDP growth, it can take on, definitely take on more debt, which is going to be sustainable than another economy that is, let's say, growing at 5% and has a debt of 50% of GDP. So uh, the point is, there's nothing sacrosanct about this uh, debt um, sustainability number. No economist or financial expert has said uh, the, the sustainable debt GDP ratio is 20% uh, or 70% or, or anything. So we've got to be careful. Uh, when you invest in infrastructure, for instance, and if it's a public project, then you've got to do the due diligence, that's for sure. But as far as the debt capability is concerned, it's moving depending on the growth of the economy and the investments that you make and the productivity gains that you get from those investments. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions here? Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, sir I raised uh, one question. So why is government fund is preferable than to that of uh, pub public private partnership projects under LDGs? Yes, your answer is, is uh, partly uh, satisfied. You know that in Bangladesh, 
there is a circular. Is a thirty percent of the total uh, projects of an organization should be under PPP, but people are not coming ahead to uh, participate in the. Can you please repeat the thirty percent of the uh, total projects of an organization? Any organization, say individual organization. What happens and to thirty percent? Thirty percent of the total project of an organization in Bangladesh. I've not understood that. You not understood? I see. No, no in, in Bangladesh. It is, say, a civil ocean authority of Bangladesh. I am the director there. Uh, there are many projects, but only one project is uh, approved under uh, HD, uh, HDZ, I mean the, under PPP. It is uh, uh, maybe uh, two to three percent of the total project. The, so I raise the question, the why people are not coming uh, to uh, go ahead uh, for the participation of development in the country. I think uh, other countries also is the same because the, uh, if the projects are done by the uh, private organization, they are not completing in time. They are not, uh, uh, I think, uh, insufficient knowledge, maybe, I think. No, I think... I've I, I think you have raised the point, uh, and this was discussed by the panel also, that you need high quality procurement processes to be able to get best quality private sector partner to do the projects. And I think you have reiterated that point. So, uh, so I think you have answered your own question, and thank you very much for that. Uh, but I, I think we need also to understand that under BOT projects, is okay, but the, the viability of projects is very critical to attract private investment. But we'll discuss this up maybe subsequently. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we have uh, no more questions there. I don't see any questions on the ticker either. Would any one of you like to uh, kind of have the last word on this? Or each one of you can have the last word. Thanks, Avi. I'll go first. I, I think for, for me, one of the things that's been demonstrated by this, um, this panel is just the need to invest in building human capability and understanding of uh, uh, procurement processes. And it's absolutely critical to... Um, to try and um, avoid some of the pitfalls that might surround uh, some of these large infrastructure projects. So I think it's um, you know, incumbent on, on donors to talk to uh, their partner countries about the way in which they can look to, to build human capital in the, the ways that um, um, the United States provides an interesting model. Sure, I'd just like to summarise by um, reiterating the point that when any country is initially looking at developing a large-scale infra infrastructure project, it's incredibly key to start early, spend and invest on the feasibility portion of that project, know exactly what it is that you want before you go in, and then utilize a professional procurement system within your country in order to ensure that you get that. After you've done that, you've got to make sure that you're consistently and continuously monitoring that project and making sure that the contracts that you've signed are being followed uh, to a T. If you can do that, I think most countries are going to find that they're going to be able to, to build long-term quality infrastructure projects that last. So uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, point out one thing, that uh, Japan is going to host G20 Osaka Summit next year. So we are going to elaborate an international uh, standard on quality infrastructure uh, through these kind of discussions in inclusive manner and uh, with developing countries as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish to reiterate again, once again, that I think uh, it's very important, I think, to bring in the investment into the country, the, the improve the confidence on the systems that are available, 
plays a vital role. So it's in that perspective, I think, you have to reform within your country certain systems uh, with outward looking, and then I think reform them both uh, regulatory wise as well as in the institutional wise to invite a more fruitful uh, investment into the picture. And at the same time, it's equally important while it's doing that the regulatory and the structural regimes in the macro level and uh, at the institutional level, it's very important to build the capacities that are necessary uh, among the, the staff of uh, the bidders as well as the, the officers and also to embrace as much as possible the new technologies that are being, I think, practiced in a lot of developed countries in the procurement processes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for having put forth uh, very clearly some principles which are important. I think uh, we are very uh, clearly uh, uh, in uh, consensus that the, to procure good quality infrastructure, it is important to uh, build upon the best practices and also the principles of procurement. We must also remember that if the procurement process is robust, transparent, and, uh, and is, uh, builds confidence in the markets, it is also easy when we are talking of sustainable debt, it also becomes easier for the governments to be able to go and access capital markets for, uh, their, for their public projects uh, and therefore uh, reduce the debt of the government or also reduce their own fiscal deficits. So uh, I would like to thank all of you and also uh, I would like to thank the audience who after a wonderful meal, I didn't see one single hand raised, so I don't think anybody slept. If they did, they must have done very quietly. Uh, thank you very much and uh, we will, uh, I will hand over the proceedings to the Thank you, Dr. Myra. And thank you to all the panelists. I think the session was extremely interesting and that's one of the reasons why we didn't, f we didn't find anybody falling asleep uh, just right after the lunch. So with that, thank you to all of you once again and request my colleague uh, Susan to hand over the token of appreciation. Thank you once again, and uh, we shall now bake for a cup of tea, and we'll be back in this room at 3.30 for the last uh, plenary. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>